All right, good morning. Welcome to Attacking Electric Motors for Fun and Profit. We're in Islander FG, if that's where your destination was taking you. And today we've got Matt Jablonski presenting. A uh, couple of brief notes. Uh, stop by the business hall in Mandalay Bay, Oceanside, Shoreline Ballrooms on level two uh, during the day. Welcome reception tonight is at 5.30. Black Hat Arsenal is in the business hall on level two, and join us for the Pony Awards in Lagoon G, H, and I at 6.30 tonight. With that, I give you Matt Jablonski. Hello, Black Hat. Uh, I hope everybody here is enjoying Black Hat so far. Um, if you want to learn about attacking movement and robots, drones, or other systems that use electric motors, like critical infrastructure, you're in the right place. And, uh, as Bill said, I'm Matt Jablonski, and this is Attacking Motors for Fun and Profit. Uh, I'm a PhD student at George Mason University, and I work in the radar and radio engineering lab uh, under Dr. Domingo uh, We've We've been studying SCADA systems, specifically with regards to railroad systems, and we noticed over the last few years that there are a lot of overlaps between uh, atta the attack surface in these systems and other systems, such as drones and, and things that use electric motors. So that, that kind of brings us to our talk here today. So uh, in this work, we simplify the attack strategies that, uh, against electric motor systems and show how they can be universally applicable to non-SCADA uh, moving systems, such as robots, drones, or other systems that use electric motors. Uh, we, we present the motor threat model, which uh, basically simplifies the description of an attacker and how they can disrupt or control movement in, in these target systems. Um, to learn what not to do with electric motors, we conducted many experiments in our lab environment and we overheated and burned out and caused lots of fires. And so, uh, despite what you might see here, we recommend uh, always following security warnings, uh, <laughs> or safety warnings, excuse me. Uh, so as a quick overview, we will discuss uh, the safety and security of moving things, the motor threat model, uh, various motor attack methods uh, at each layer of the threat model, as well as experimental validation of our model, and conclude with some discussion. Uh, in order to describe the motor threat model, we'll introduce a game for you guys to play along with. So imagine most uh, attendees here at Black Hat know something about security and threat modeling, and I hope you can play along. Uh, th this game is basically structured to help understand how to threat model movement. Uh, your company in this case, was hired to assess the security risks of a proprietary drone system designed to deliver packages worldwide. Hundreds of operators uh, around the globe will manage 30 plus different drone models that are proprietary, ranging in size, uh, to deliver packages to cities around the globe. And they obviously have physical and remote access to these drones. The uh, operating company decided that they're not gonna do background checks um, uh, for these personnel. So control will be wireless uh, within the line of sight or over the internet, and will be automated to every possible extent. So what is the attack surface? What are the threats? And if you have ever worked for a pen testing company, we need your report today. Um, so uh, in any critical infrastructure system, safety has historically been the priority. Safety controls focus on avoiding accidental risks. On the security side, we focus on intentional misuse. So intent is the key difference between safety and security, really. Uh, for safety, operators uh, in our drone system will be trained and certified to handle the systems as they would uh, uh, for the real world environment. Uh, the systems are, are built to have fail safe. So when some expected, unexpected event occurs, uh, protections will be in place. Um, Generally, rules, risks, and uh, or rules, excuse me, regulations and standards uh, have been developed over years for these systems that move, and different organizations have oversight depending on the system. In the example of drones, it'll be the FAA in the United States. Uh, security risks, on the other hand, are traditionally different for every system. So here's our first security problem. As InfoSec professionals, we think like bad guys. And, that, and then uh, we immediately consider all the potential methods to misuse this system. Uh, within our example scenario, maybe this uh, meme here is the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, but uh, identifying threats and mitigations is where the fun and profit part of our talk comes into play. Uh, sometimes this approach is very structured, and we can fall back on our training. Uh, for example, if targeting a web application, I know I can use Burp to find cross-site scripting or CSERP vulnerabilities. Other times, we're forced to reverse engineer the system and logically show where the risk could occur. 
So uh, recommendations such as uh, this is a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad delivery drone thing that you're delivering is not going to lead to fun and profit. Um, so let's look inside the system. What do we see? Uh, we immediately, uh, what comes to our eye is uh, there are two communication channels. One is 4G LTE over the internet and uh, second one is a 2.4 gigahertz channel for line of sight control. There's a couple of different possible operator uh, uh, interfaces then uh, depending on which interface they're communicating with. And this system has a number of sensors to include GPS, accelerometers, other inertial measurements, etc. And it has a central controller uh, that manages uh, or that maintains, excuse me, wireless communications and controls the uh, electronic speed controllers or ESCs uh, used to uh, control the motor. And this controller is running Linux. So maybe some thoughts are coming to mind about what you could attack here. Uh, at this point, uh, we'll probably take our research and start looking through other drone uh, attack talks in, in recent years. Uh, and we'll find examples in research uh, about uh, reverse engineering communication channels, uh, uploading flight plans via FTP because somebody thinks that's a good idea, or taking over the drone's Wi-Fi uh, hotspot and using a phone app to control the drone. These are all good things to get started. However, the vulnerabilities are always system specific and uh, remember that our scenario is a proprietary system. So let's take a step back. Uh, having reviewed uh, related systems, you may uh, want to take kind of go over how do electric motors work in the first place. So in digital systems, every electric motor is connected to a drive uh, which provides some electric power to the motor. Um, these drives can be electronic speed controllers, as I mentioned, or in SCADA systems, they're variable speed drives, or var variable frequency drives. Uh, they can be embedded or even a microchip or part of the SOC. Uh, some drives have more than one motor. It just depends on the system. Pulse width modulation uh, allows for varying the speed of the motor. And uh, in order for pulse width modulation to work, it fluctuates the voltage. And when voltage is greater than zero, uh, the motor, motor pulls current in order to move. Uh, the frequency of switching is controlled by a clock um, and the amount of time where voltage is greater than zero is known as the duty cycle. Both the clock and the duty cycle are controlled in hardware and software. Uh, electrical current provided, uh, provided by the drive is the input to the motor. At a high level, the current flows through windings internal to the motor and interacts with the magnets to produce an electromagnetic field. The rotor is part of the motor that moves, the stator is the part that's stationary, that's kind of self-explanatory. Uh, the output of the motor is mechanical energy in the form of torque and speed and output power, physics stuff. Uh, the structure and behavior of the motor can vary depending on the type of system. It can be DC versus AC or rotary versus linear, etc. And the selection of the motor is uh, really based on the load. So, all motors basically have data sheets, so if you're reverse engineering or targeting a system like a drone, look up the data sheet for the motor. It'll tell you about the torque versus speed uh, relationship, and uh, uh, which tells you the operational parameters of the drone. In this case, for this simple graph for a brushed uh, DC motor, uh, we, uh, if, if you look at the far left, uh, when torque is high and speed is zero, basically, this is known as a stall torque and prolonged exposure to this kind of behavior. Uh, will overheat and burn out the motor. Um, when speed is high and torque is zero, this is a no load condition. And basically, in either the stall uh, torque or no load condition, uh, power output is, is minimalized, as you can tell by the right graph. So how do we design a control system to drive a motor? Uh, it's basic control theory, of course. There are two types of uh, universal design methodologies to build such a system, an open loop and a closed loop uh, design. In an open loop design, some input is provided to a controller without changing the system state. Uh, the controller executes the input, passes commands to the drive, and provides current to the motor, impacting the output load. In closed loop, we add a feedback mechanism, which sensors collect data on the uh, current system state to the environment. The controller uses this information to adjust the drive and uh, motor parameters. And that's basically it. Uh, however, this brings us to a big security problem. Uh, understanding generically how movement uh, is controlled and using control theory 
tends to be, uh, bring more, excuse me, uh, what ifs and questions. Where can an attack against movement come from? What would the attacker's goals be? How realistic are security concerns at each level of the stack? Another concern is that digital control commands through pulse width modulation are not authenticated. Controller or drive controller access would allow for modifications to a motor's duty cycle, resulting in timing attacks with real world consequences. This is the challenge of uh, basically managing continuous movement using discrete commands. So since we took a step back and looked at electric motors, uh, and focused on digital control systems for movement, we might start researching other systems uh, and, and their threats and vulnerabilities uh, looking uh, for attacks on movement. Uh, research and security focused on robotics, SCADA systems, uh, printers, 3D printers, and other moving devices uh, show a lot of parallels to our drone or proprietary drone system, as they all use a controller to create precise movements using electric motors. However, we found there's not a universal or common threat model to describe these relationships, uh, despite the common design patterns. So that's, that's our goal for this talk, is to present one. Um, so let's step away from drones and look at some common attack strategies and, and requirements. Um, some of our requirements are uh, attacks, use digital movement, attacks using digital movement controls have real world impacts, which we want to identify. Attacks can be either cyber or physical um, in nature. The model should, uh, should identify where attacks that leverage discrete commands may occur. There's basically two different models that we can start, use as a starting point uh, to uh, threat model movement. The first one is the uh, ICS cyber kill chain, um, which defines SCADA attacks require, as requiring two different stages. Stage one covers cyber espionage, but it's really just relevant to SCADA systems. Uh, stage two is probably more applicable to movement in general, but it's kind of vague as shown in the picture on the right, if you can see. Uh, develop, test, deliver, modify, execute attack. It's pretty vague. Um, and uh, the ICS cyber kill chain does define uh, goals for movement, which we can use uh, in our threat model. Um, these, there are three goals, basically. An attacker will want to control the system, disrupt the system, or steal data regarding the system. We'll, we'll expand on these in a moment. Um, the second possible model that we can look at is MITRE's ICS attack framework, but it's still in draft, and it's also fake, it's just focused on SCADA systems, not drones or robots or anything else. It allows for identification of attack stages that allow for attack attribution as kind of a post-mortem analysis, but they don't focus on physical attacks and the model cannot be applied to all systems. So with these measurements in mind, and after an extensive review of our electric motor systems and throwing a dash of control theory, you're welcome, uh, we came up with this model, which we call the motor threat model. Um, this looks complex and hard to remember. Uh, don't worry, we'll simplify it in a moment. So just like with control theory, controls flow from seven, operator, to five, control, to four, drive, to two motor to one load. Uh, the digital control portions require three power as input, which may be single or three phase power, even batteries, depending on the system. Uh, finally, in a closed loop system, six sensors collect data and provide that feedback information to the various layers in order to make precise movements, uh, decisions based on the hardware and software design. Okay, let's see how we can make this simpler. So if we take the layers and stack them, similarly to an OSI stack or a file system stack, we can more easily categorize attacks against movement. The stack from top to bottom is seven operator, six sensor, five control, four drive, three power, two motor, one load. Uh, if you notice from the drawing, starting at the right, physical attacks can really occur at any of the layers and are limited to basically stopping or stealing movement uh, controls at all layers. Uh, similarly, on the left, cyber attacks are more effective at the higher layers. Uh, traditionally in research, whether it's drones, robots, or SCADA systems, attackers have targeted the operator, sensor, and control layers, because this is a natural attack surface for network and cyber-related attacks. However, depending on the system, the drive, power, and motor layers may require firmware or even have network uh, controls. Uh, we, we simply star these layers to show that most cyber attacks will target the higher layers. Uh, with this description, 
if an adversary targets the lower layers, they basically disrupt or take control of movement from the higher layers. This may be enough in many cases for an adversary to complete their mission. Uh, we believe the, uh, the stacked approach simplifies differentiating between cyber and physical attacks too. And we'll, we'll show you that throughout the rest of this talk. Uh, a friend of mine recommended coming up with a simple mnemonic method to memorize the layers. Uh, the best I could come up with was offensive security, can do precise movement lulls. Um, uh, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, as previously mentioned, there's really three high level attack objectives for movement that the stack model can assist with identifying kill chains to prevent. Uh, understanding the adversary's goals before identifying attack strategies is uh, critical for defending any system. So control, um, as mentioned before, with this objective, this, the adversary wants to steal control to basically achieve some goal which is uh, refined based on the system. Generally this is done at the higher layers through cyber attacks, but physical access may be possible to the operator uh, interface at the uh, operator layer. Uh, this, uh, is basically easiest at the operator, sensor, control, or drive layers. Um, disrupt. With this objective, the adversary may want to stop movement or inject commands to modify uh, precisely time movements or prevent operational controls. This can be achieved through both cyber and physical attacks and uh, is achievable really at all seven layers. And then finally, data exfiltration or just simply steal data. With this objective, adversary may want to violate IP um, or privacy of the system's owner to track the system usage. Uh, this is generally done through cyber attacks and is easiest at the operator sensor or control layers. So now that you have some kind of idea of the types of attacks and the desired attacker outcomes, we provide this table to basically show these relationships at the various layers as shown up at the various layers. Um, in, on the right two columns, you can see how and where cyber and physical attacks uh, could be used at each of the layers, as well as you can, uh, we've identified the attack objectives that could be leveraged at each layer, uh, whether it's uh, control, disrupt, or data exfiltration. The operator layer is basically unprivileged motor control. You only can use the APIs that were provided to the oper operator layer for moving the system. Um, and it consists of attacks targeting either the operator interface itself or the operator control channel. Uh, lateral movement to the control layer is possible through this channel. Uh, the sensor layer provides feedback on the physical environment and attacks against this layer are designed to basically falsify the data in order to trigger some different movement. Um, it consists of two different levels, uh, either targeting the sensors or a wireless sensor network if one exists, or even the out-of-band safety system which uh, provides um, fail-safe controls back to the controller as input. Um, in the control layer, layer five, uh, it, it's basically privileged access or root control to movement in the system. You control it, if you control the system's controller and or the control drive channel, which is used to precisely control uh, motor movements, um, you basically own the system, uh, own movement within the system. Uh, below that, at the drive layer, it handles individual motor movements using some minimal configuration designed for the specific motor that that drive was uh, designed to control. Uh, this layer consists of attacks both on the drive controller and attacks on the drive motor uh, channel, which is usually just the motor leads and uh, where current uh, uh, flows from the drive's power supply. For the last three layers, these are primarily physical attacks. The power layer, uh, basically describes attacks targeting electrical power inputs to system components, which can limit or prevent movement altogether, obviously. Uh, this layer requires access to the power system and generally requires physical access or a physical access attack is expected. Uh, the motor layer is why we're all here. Uh, all movement basically goes through the motor. Generally, these attacks require physical access, but some motors, such as digital servos, uh, can be reprogrammed um, uh, to completely change their movement outcomes, which uh, we'll provide an example of in a moment. Uh, finally, the load layer is the output layer. It consists of the motor shaft, connecting gears, and any components that, are, uh, that interact with the physical world. Uh, an attack here requires physical access. So now with the seven layers designed, that's our seven layer stack. Uh, the types of attacks at each layer really vary per system. 
Um, we'll show how to further refine this model for attackers, defenders, and we'll get back to our game in a moment. But we've got a number of attack experiments to basically show at each layer um, some examples of how an attacker can control or disrupt movement. So for our first target, um, we just have a simple remote control car. And this, this is an attack basically against the operator control channel. Uh, it's modeled after really many attacks and research taking control of drones and robots uh, using uh, SDR. So uh, here we see the remote control car and the operator interface. And the operator interface basically has two controls, forward and reverse. Uh, wireless controls the vehicle over a standard uh, communication channel at 27 megahertz. And a review of the controller shows that a sim simple oscillating crystal produces the resonating frequency for both forward and reverse. So with a Hacker F1, all we need to do is capture both the forward and reverse controls for about a second, and we've got complete uh, control of the vehicle. Because it's just an oscillating crystal, we don't even have to decode. Uh, we don't have to filter. We don't require any complex reverse engineering. Uh, we just uh, are able to control movement. Um, so we can slice up the collection files from the SDR and basically move, move the device anywhere uh, we want. Uh, the picture on the left basically shows the wheel turning and the operator controller in the background because the uh, SDR is controlling the vehicle. Uh, so the, this second attack experiment was designed also to target the operator control channel. And, and we uh, call this attack a remote pin control attack. Uh, we have a simple target system here designed to allow us to uh, control a motor, inject attacks, and graph the resulting output of torque using a, a mini pro dynamometer or a dyno. Uh, in this experiment, the Pi is the controller sending commands to the electronic speed controller using pulse width modulation uh, through GPIO 18. Uh, the speed controller provides current from the LiPo battery to the brush DC motor and is connected to the dyno for measurements. Uh, this, is, this physical setup will be used in many of the examples kind of moving forward, and I'll refer back to it. Uh, the Pi is running a baseline script that just runs the motor at a particular speed using the wiring Pi library. It's also running a PigPyO daemon, which is built in a Raspbian for uh, GPIO control. And we enabled remote GPIO, which basically, if you can interact with it over the network, you have direct memory access to the Raspberry Pi. Um, Ras uh, Ras or PigPi, or excuse me, developers uh, added this feature to simplify remote pin management for uh, hobbyists. But we're going to exploit this feature. So uh, assume we gain access to the same network as the Pi. Running Nmap on the uh, network identifies uh, key, two key features about the Pi. Um, basically, TCP port 22 shows that it's running a Raspbian version of OpenSSH, so we've identified a Pi. And TCP port uh, 8888 is open with an interesting string. We've got NCP colon DMDT. And we checked several different Pi versions and uh, versions of Raspbian, and we believe this is an indicator for remote GPIO. So the script on the right is just a simple Python control script for the attacker that could be leveraged uh, through their tunnel into the network or by importing the uh, GPIO zero Python module onto a compromised host in the local network. Uh, the attacker basically changes the clock value or motor dot frequency to 250 and then uh, alternates the duty cycle between 30 and 40 percent. Uh, for this example, uh, we guess GPIO 18 is a pin we can do stuff with, although with this particular example, um, the attacker is really blind to the GPIO control on the Pi uh, from the network. Um, just simply calling the script with pigpio uh, underscore ADDR environmental variable uh, trigger, uh, targeting the target's IP address triggers the GPIO zero module to send the commands over the network to port 888 and basically giving the attacker control over the pin. Uh, so. Here's an output speed graph from the dyno, just basically showing RPM versus time. The top line is the baseline run, um, and it's suspected motor behavior without the attacker's involvement. The script uh, uses a single motor command to drive the motor up to about 24,000 RPM, as you can tell. Uh, we have a circle highlighted on the graph to show where the attacker's script basically takes control uh, over the motor. The uh, alternation of 30 to 40 percent can be seen uh, in the variation of speed over time, it kind of looks spiky. Um, as a baseline script does not repeatedly issue discrete commands and there's no other sensors monitoring the system, the attacker now has complete control over movement from the operator control channel. So uh, on to the sensor layer. 
Uh, attacks to the sensor layer are a little more complex, generally require additional reverse engineering uh, to take control of the system because it's, a, it's critical to understand how this feedback data is used as input uh, to affect movement uh, decisions in software. Um, in this setup, we have a ADXL345 accelerometer, uh, which in software, the pod is just using, taking the X, Y, and Z axis from the accelerometer, and then using it to control the, the angle of the output servo, um, as you can see in the two drawings on the right. Uh, the accelerometer communicates the pi using I2C, serial bus protocol. And the I2C uh, protocol is a master-slave protocol where the master requests data from the slave. In this case, the, the master's the pi, accelerator's the slave. To simplify this description, in the middle uh, picture, the board is flat on the table, and we see that the servo is angled almost at like six o'clock because of the X, Y, and Z axis. And when we tilt the uh, breadboard, we see the servo adjusted by the pi, and the drive controller to an angle between about seven and eight o'clock. Um, we can use a Saley logic analyzer to sniff, capture, and decode the I2C protocol. So when we decode, we observe the I2C handshake between the pi and the accelerometer. Uh, it takes place over three bytes, and then there's an additional six bytes of data providing the X, Y, and Z um, coordinates. We cheat in this example and connect an intact pi to the I2C bus to capture the I2C address of the, uh, of basically zero, zero by 53 uh, targeting the ADXL345. So then we can rewire the Pi, as shown in the drawing on the right there, uh, turning it into a uh, I2C slave as an attempt to disrupt or control movement. So the pictures on this slide basically show the outcome of, our, of two different attacks. So on, on the left, uh, this is a disrupt or jam scenario. Our attack Pi basically responds to I2C requests at the same time as the accelerometer. So the responses collide on the bus, uh, but the input device interprets the bits anyways. Um, and uh, in our simple collision test, the board just moves the uh, sensor, uh, uh, excuse me, the servo angle in the manner uh, to about seven o'clock, as you can see in that left drawing. In the right picture, uh, we basically sever, or we could desolder, if this was on a breadboard, the uh, ADXL345 and uh, because we can communicate and respond to our target pi, we have complete control over those six bytes and can basically move the servo to whatever angle we want. Um, so that's, that's an example for this sensor layer. Uh, on the, onto the control layer. Um, basically, here we assume the attacker has gained access to the controller uh, of our pi in our previous setup using the uh, ESC and brush motor and dyna. The Pi is running a baseline script that increases the speed of the motor every half a second uh, until it hits about 16,000 RPM at a peak, and then it sleeps for five seconds and then starts decreasing the speed every half a second. So the graphs on the left and right show two different attack strategies uh, against this script. Um, so in, on, in the graph on the right, the first circle on the left is basically a single command injection where the attacker is saying, hey, stop the motor. Um, because the controller is updating its frequency and speed every half a second, this is minimal effect, but uh, kind of jerks the motor. Uh, however, if that same single command injection is applied after the motor sleeps for five seconds, you can see that the motor basically starts grinding to a halt until the controller wakes up and applies additional commands. Um, uh, in the second graph, uh, we, uh, it, it just basically shows a single command injection Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the graph on the right, the attacker begins uh, uh, basically issuing commands every 100 milliseconds from the uh, uh, first red circle to through the second red circle at a faster rate than the uh, motor uh, controller uh, software. It, uh, and you can see that the motor, th uh, excuse me, the attacker has complete control over the motor between these two um, circles, uh, keeping a motor at about 10,000 RPM. So if you have more granular access and you issue um, commands at a faster rate than an uh, application, this is just showing how you can take over the motor as an attacker. Uh, for a second control attack, this uh, basically, we, we target here the control drive channel to take over user movement. So a, as a reminder, uh, basically, the Pi uses pulse width modulation as a control signal to and from the electronic speed controller 
uh, to, to basically uh, drive the motor. In this setup, we show how to introduce a hardware implant to take over control of the channel uh, and of system movement without the controller even knowing and assuming it's, uh, also assuming that sensors are not present. Uh, generally, uh, wiring and, dri uh, and drives like uh, in systems like robots or small moving vehicles, um, you, you'll see a two-wire or a three-wire connection um, and the pinout is noted here in the slide. Uh, the black wire is a common ground wire. Uh, the red wire is basically designed to provide current, and it may or may not be used in the event a separate power rail is used. A white or yellow uh, wire is used for control and is usually just pulse width modulation. So here we take an attack pie, uh, which could really be any uh, hardware implant, and we just connect uh, the white uh, wire there to GPIO 18, uh, which is our pulse width modulation on our attack pie, and the black wire to the attack pie's ground. And then uh, the attack pie, we just we have a simple script uh, in Python where we set GPIO 18 pin mode to input. We wait about five seconds after seeing a pulse width modulation signal, and then we change uh, the uh, GPIO 18 to uh, pulse width modulation mode, and it basically takes control of the motor. Um, this graph shows the results. Uh, the blue line represents a baseline run that drives the motor up to about 24,000 RPM. The uh, two attack runs in this graph show our attack script takes complete control uh, over the motor. We can slow down or speed up the motor at will and completely control the pulse width modulation signal. Uh, the hardware implant attack works uh, once the attack pie takes control over the pin, basically. Smaller boards could be used to replicate this attack. It, it, um, a good mitigation here might be to make wiring harder to access um, within the system, and maybe adding tamper evidence or tamper resistance uh, controls to prevent attacks against this channel. Um, okay, so let's move on to the drive layer. Many times a drive layer is a separate controller or board from the main controller, as a drive controller is just designed to handle the additional power load in order to drive the motor. Uh, we continue our example here targeting the Pi as open source examples are easy to follow. Uh, the Raspberry Pi 3 uh, B Plus uses Broadcom BCM 2837 SOC, and physical memory registers are used to control or change pin status within the SOC. The code here may be a bit hard to see, um, but uh, we have more details in the paper. Um, we're basically able to identify the register locations in memory through reading the data sheet and, uh, and uh, reverse engineering the wiring Pi library, which is a common commonly used uh, library for pin control in the pie. Um, and then, uh, and then uh, ident uh, once we identify these locations, we can memory map and control pins by just uh, updating their status in memory. Uh, for our first attack, we basically uh, use the same Raspberry Pi setup that we did um, before. Uh, this attack is essentially the same attack presented by Abazi and Hashemi at uh, Black Hat Europe 2016. It was called Ghost in the PLC. Basically, uh, with, with root or similar access to the running application, an attacker can change the pin mode from pulse width modulation or to, base, to input, which we did here. And you can see that once the pin was changed to input, the, it basically pulse width modulation stopped and the motor stopped as well. Uh, Hashemi and Abazi showed how to turn this into a root kit. Um, so for a second drive layer attack, we changed our configuration to use a brushless motor as uh, pictured here. Brushless motors uh, are more efficient than brush motors and do not spark under abnormal conditions, and uh, we had some issues uh, with fire in doing this experiment. Um, so we want to control abnormal conditions, uh, basically to modify the clock and duty cycle values to see the impact on the motor. So the graph here uh, basically shows the results of modifying the clock and data registers. Uh, in software libraries, to control the speed of the motor, the libraries may adjust uh, the clock and duty cycle values to ensure that the motor runs at a certain speed or, uh, in the case of a servo motor, at a certain angle. Uh, by keeping the range register static, we cycle through clock and data values to see what the impact the motor uh, output would be. And as we increase the clock value, uh, you can see that the data value needed to move the motor, basically clockwise or counterclockwise, direction decreased as frequency in the clock increase. Um, an attack strategy here to disrupt performance against a motor um, could simply involve changing the clock value. Uh, 
uh, which would change the direction of the motor or even stop the motor altogether if the application used uh, uh, duty cycle values um, that produced no movements with the new clock value. Uh, for our last uh, attack against the drive layer, we take control of the ability to read and write uh, those GPIO registers to basically record and playback movement uh, to, be, to allow us to reverse engineer movement in a system. Um, if we go back to our earlier Pi setup with the brush motor and run a script, we can write a script basically that captures the clock, data, and range register values um, every 100 milliseconds, or at least more granular than uh, the controller um, application that's running. A second script can then just be run to play back these uh, values every 100 milliseconds. And as we can see by the two curves in the graph, uh, the capture and playback of movement by simply monitoring register values uh, produce the exact same movement. So this technique, basically, as I said before, could be used to reverse engineer uh, movements in complex applications, uh, but it will generally require root access. <coughs> so with the power layer and below, Attacks uh, usually require physical access. So techniques have been proven feasible in research, such as uh, firmware attacks and rechargeable batteries that could be used to modify overcurrent or low voltage parameters. In this experiment, uh, we simply show the results of introducing a low voltage battery uh, to movement. A low voltage battery basically simulates a brownout condition uh, on the motor's performance. Uh, we ran our LiPo battery down a low voltage condition, which is usually not recommended because LiPo batteries can catch fire or supposedly explode in low voltage conditions, um, which we didn't actually see. Um, but the baseline run in this graph uh, shows the expected uh, motor performance under normal voltage conditions, uh, running the motor up to about 25,000 RPM. Uh, with the low voltage battery, the motor was slow to take off. Um, and the battery also just popped and shook the workbench um, when, when we started the motor up. Uh, this graph shows the motor was unable to come close to, to its target RPM and just kind of topped out at about 18,000 RPM before uh, petering off. Um, this, this graph is those same two runs, but we compare torque and power output, which might be kind of hard to see, so we apologize. Uh, uh, under the low voltage scenario. Basically, uh, both torque and power output are drastically uh, um, uh, affected uh, negatively without uh, the proper voltage, uh, just because the motor's struggling to pull current. And if the motor's struggling to pull current, uh, it can overheat um, and reduce the lifetime of the motor. So next, we'll go on to the motor layer. Uh, attacks against the motor layer are usually physical and could be as simple as pulling leads or shorting the motor if overload protections are not in place. Um, we decided to be a little more creative and wanted to see the impact of an electromagnet on the performance of the motor if introduced to a running motor. Uh, we basically hypothesize uh, that the additional electromagnetic presence uh, within the motor would change the movement um, characteristics of the motor. And we, we procured the, uh, a uh, 500 Newton electromotor, as you see there, that, which runs off a 12 volt battery. Uh, we found that by placing the electromagnet over the holes used for ventilation in our brush motor actually did uh, impact the magnetic flux uh, internal to the motor, but not in the way that we, we had anticipated. So, in this graph, we show a baseline script that runs the motor up to about 25,000 RPM again. And when the electromagnet is introduced to the motor in the second attack run, the same baseline script consistently increased the motor speed by about 3 to 4 percent up to 26,000 RPM. The uh, circle in this graph uh, is used to highlight the removal of the electromagnet in our second attack run. Once removed during the run, the motor uh, basically slowed back down to the original uh, intended uh, 25,000 RPM target. Um, so moving on to our second um, motor attack experiment, we wanted to show how simple it is to reprogram a digital servo um, if they're using a target application. If, if, you, if, if your target robot or drone or any kind of system uh, has a digital servo, chances are it has some kind of marking either externally or internally that tells who that manufacturer is. If you know the manufacturer, you can generally find that they also like to sell programmers to change the characteristics of the motor. So the left picture, we basically show the high-tech programmer uh, in line with the servo, along with some of the characteristics that can be reprogrammed, such as direction, speed, and dead band width. Um, in the right picture, we show how easy it is to change the servo's direction from clockwise to counterclockwise. 
Uh, this change is permanent, really, until somebody fixes the motor or until it's reprogrammed again. So basically, these pictures show the results of changing the direction. The top pictures, uh, we have a motor uh, change in software to 25, 45, 90, and 125 degrees. Uh, and then we flipped uh, the motor from running clockwise to counterclockwise, and we just ran the same script again, 25, 45, 90, 125 degrees. You can see that basically, uh, movement, uh, angular movement for the digital servo is reflected. So if, if this was done to something like a 3D printer or a uh, uh, robot, basically um, the movements would appear backward to what an expected output would be. Um, the controller might detect uh, the calibration or detect an issue during calibration shut down or the system may fall back to a fail safe state. And uh, for our last layer, the load layer, uh, these attacks are almost always physical, and the attacker may want to prevent any movement or shift weight on the load to overheat the motor and reduce the motor's lifetime. Uh, here we have a simple experiment to show what happens when we burn out a motor. Um, we procured a simple desk fan, as shown in the picture, and used a temperature probe to monitor the motor's temperature over time. Uh, this fan uh, uses a brushless motor. Um, I set the fan basically on high setting and used my hand to prevent it from moving, and every 10 minutes allowed it to move freely and measured, measured its speed with a tachometer uh, to ch see the motor's performance over time. So what ended up happening was after 61 minutes, uh, the fan burned out. Um, based on the graph on the right, you can see that it started off run operating at about 7,000 RPM and dropped over that hour to about 6,000 RPM before completely dying. Um, on the right graph, you can see that the temperature of the motor internally uh, rose into 180 degrees. And so at prolonged high temperatures, what happens is the winding insulation in the motor uh, lifetime, it, it, it significantly decreases uh, until the point that the insulation uh, cannot assure proper current flow uh, and the motor just stops running. And this is actually another way to attack motors, just apply high heat, really, to the insulation. You'll just burn your motor out. Um, Visually, if we compare a good motor and a bad motor, we don't even see any difference. And so forensically, it just looks like the motor wore out over time. Um, okay, and that concludes our example experiments uh, at the various motor threat model layers. And hopefully now it's kind of easier to understand how attacks at different layers can result uh, in disruption or control um, to an electric motor system's movements. So. Uh, you see the seven layers, and remember, uh, offensive security can do precise movement lulls. Um, so let's return back to where we started and complete our game. Uh, in case you forgot the scenario or showed up in the middle of the talk, uh, here it is again. You're a risk assessor, and your company just landed a job of assessing a global drone delivery system. The drone company uses about 30 different drone models, hundreds of operators worldwide have both physical and remote access, and the company won't be conducting background checks. Uh, and control occurs over the internet. So what can go wrong? Uh, well, with any threat model, we want to define who our attackers may be. In this case, we consider the following actors may have interest in disrupting movement over a drone delivery system. Uh, nation state adversary is good at cyber and physical attacks. Uh, such an attacker can target all seven layers of the motor threat model. A cyber criminal is good at cyber attacks. They usually profit off of data. Uh, collection and could target data in the drone system at the operator, sensor, or control layers. A terrorist is good at cyber attacks in, the system, uh, in this scenario. Uh, they would be interested in controlling or disrupting movement to cause fear. These attacks could occur at the operator, sensor, or control layers. Finally, an insider could also uh, leverage cyber or physical attacks, and they may either be a disgruntled employee or a social engineering victim. Uh, in the case of a disgruntled employee, they could sabotage movement at any layer. Uh, in the social engineering case, uh, these attacks would just occur at the higher layers. Uh, next, the next step, we refine our three goals for a target system uh, to allow us to create attack graphs and identify all the kill chains which we could use uh, to build security mitigations and prevent or detect attacks. Uh, for the uh, control attacks, the attacker may want to steal the drones or alter movement off their desired course. Uh, for uh, disrupt attacks, the attacker may be uh, interested in creating physical damage or physical harm, or just preventing movement altogether. Uh, for data exfiltration attacks, the attacker may be interested in uh, gathering data with regards to systems usage or deliveries, which could be considered a privacy invasion. So 
with the motor threat model, we can now basically create attack trees for all three attacks, attack graphs, um, or all three attack goals, excuse me. For each goal, we know the layer at which it'll occur. Um, we can identify the uh, necessary components and channels that may make up each layer, review the hardware, software, and communication uh, protocols, and create detailed attack graphs, which, would, uh, which could be followed at each layer to reach the same goal. Uh, the result of these graphs is a multi-layered kill chain, essentially for movement, which can be used to secure the system's movements. Um, if we know where the cyber physical attacks could occur, um, then we can prevent those attacks from occurring as security professionals and gain fun and profit. So now to close out our game scenario, um, we just revisit the internals of the system and we can begin applying labels to the components according to the motor threat model layers. So each component is, uh, can be studied individually by a risk assessor uh, to produce those attack trees that I just showed you against control, disrupt, and data exfiltration uh, objectives. Um, we've analyzed this approach against uh, several systems, uh, to include SCADA systems and drones, obviously, uh, and, found, uh, and robots, uh, and found that it works for systems that we've analyzed that use electric motors for movement. Um, more complex systems will result in a obviously more complex models. Um, however, uh, the threat assessment could be conducted in stages, maybe following individual layers, depending on where the attacker model uh, uh, looks like and their possible goals. Um, so, so before I close out, uh, here's, our, uh, here's my boneyard from experimentation. I burned out a lot of motors, caught a lot of things on fire, and probably most of it was due because I'm pretty crappy solder. Um, so as for Black Hat sound bites, there's three takeaways from today's presentation. Um, I, you can identify basically three attack goals against movement in electric motor systems. Control, disrupt, data exfiltration. Uh, any system that leverages electric motors uh, built using control theory, basically has seven layers that can be attacked from either a uh, physical or a cyber perspective. Um, and those seven layers are operator, sensor, control, drive, power, motor, and load, or Offensive security can do precise movement lulls. Uh, this works as a universal model against movement as best we can tell. And again, I mentioned that we've tried it against some of these other systems. So we hope that you find the motor threat model simple and uh, maybe can even help us make it better. So thanks. This concludes uh, attacking electric motors for fun and profit. I hope uh, the motor threat model is easy to understand and we're interested in feedback and hopefully you'll provide reviews uh, um, and I'm happy to entertain questions or uh, uh, talk, uh, answer questions outside if there are any. Otherwise, we're done. <laughs>